of you at home. Um, it's, good to, it's good to be here. It's good to be back. I missed being here last week. Um, and it was cold on that pond. So um, I have a question for you. Have, have any of you ever heard of a place called Gehenna? Okay, if you, some of you have. Um, but if you haven't, it's a small valley in Jerusalem, sometimes called the Valley of Hinnom. Um, it looks, that's what it looks like now. Um, a beautiful place to walk through. Um, however, Gehenna was initially the place where some of the kings of Judah sacrificed their children to Baal, or Moloch. Um, and this is, what, this is what it means when we encounter phrases in the Bible, such as passing through the fire, um, human sacrifice. And so, even though it looks beautiful now, during biblical times it appeared more like this. It was used as a garbage dump, a place that would be considered a wasteland. And because it was a place where fires burned continuously, it was also a convenient location where desperate people would hold rituals of human sacrifice. It's not a beautiful place. It looks dangerous. And what we have to remember is that Baal is a dangerous god. Um, in times of despair, when people struggled with their faith, they sometimes looked for answers from other gods. They turned to Baal not because of trust, but because they believed that God had abandoned them, and they feared what Baal might do if they didn't offer these sacrifices. Israel has a very complicated history. And in 1979... Some archaeologists began excavating the area that is believed to be ancient Gehenna. And what they found, right by where the walls of the old city of Jerusalem are thought to be, they found what's considered to be one of the oldest pieces of scripture that exists in the world. It's 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it dates from a time just before the destruction of the first temple of Solomon in 586 B.C. So the scorched ground yielded up two silver amulets, and these are on display um, in the Israel Museum. And when they finally um, unfurled what the text said, it was almost verbatim to, to the Bible verse in Numbers 6.24-6. 26. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God turn his face toward you and give you peace. That's a priestly blessing. It's the blessing that parents recite for their children every Friday night. A fervent prayer for the future. It's ironic. It's ironic that the oldest bit of scripture that exists is a blessing of peace that was snatched from a place where human children are believed to have been sacrificed. Let's pray. Dear God, you light the way of true life. We look up to Jesus for his courage and kindness. Jesus shows us how to be brave and follow you. Empower us this day by your Holy Spirit to turn away from temptations and live as disciples who love and trust you. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our scriptures, the scriptures that we read today, can be somewhat unsettling for most Americans. Because in truth, the words that Jesus spoke were a little unsettling for the first listeners as, as well. Um, his message challenged the worldview back then, and it challenges our worldview right now. But making sense of this blessing of woes, I mean, making sense of these blessings and these woes begins with an understanding of the ancient Hebrew text that we read in Jeremiah. The, the one helps us understand the other because Jeremiah reminds us of the enormous power of the human heart, will, mind, ego, and self to deceive. The two words that are used to describe the heart are devious and per perverse. And at its core, the root for 
for the human heart means insidious uh, or both enticing and harmful. These are not words that we usually associate with the heart. So in other words, what Jeremiah is saying is that our fallibility to the temptations of evil are inescapable. There is no escape for humans from the human heart, will, mind, ego, and or self. However, because this passage is a lament, it's one of the laments of Jeremiah, it contrasts this reality of our human condition with a more positive possibility. Jeremiah proclaims that the human heart can be orientated, trained, fixed, not on mortals, but rather on Yahweh, which is the biblical definition of blessedness. The text closes with a biblical truth, that if we keep our heart, mind, will, ego, and self oriented toward God and live our lives in a way that reflects that, we will experience blessings and bear fruit. Now, it's important that we don't misread or misinterpret this truth. It's not a conditional if-then statement. But it is often used like that. It's often used as the biblical foundation for the myth of the American dream, that if you do everything right, God will bless you, and wealth is evidence of God's blessing. Unfortunately, this interpretation is a gross misreading of both Jeremiah and Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. The myth of the American dream is the rags to riches story, which is very popular in Hollywood and is, is more often than not based on a true story of a hardworking person who overcame multiple obstacles in his or her journey to success. Hollywood, however, tends to overemphasize the myth and leave out the parts that truly define a person's character. The movie In Pursuit of Happiness, which shares the story of Single, of a single father trying to overcome a series of hardships in order to succeed in the financial wor world is a good example of this misrepresentation. The movie is based on Chris Gardner's real life experience. That's Chris Gardner and his son. And, and he is struggling to create a better life for himself and for his son. Ultimately, his perseverance results in a full-time position at a brokerage firm and then a few years later, he is able to establish his own firm, which we know as Gardner Rich and Company, which is located in Chicago. Now Luke says, blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. So according to Hollywood, if wealth represents the kingdom of God, we might conclude that Gardner's story is a modern day parable depicting this proclamation. And it is but not in the way that you're thinking. Because there are, are a lot of things that we miss about Gardner's story if we rely solely on the Hollywood version. It tells his story the way we want to hear it. If we work hard and do the right thing, God will bless us, and wealth is evidence of God's blessing. However, even though Gardner achieved success in the financial services in industry, he had to survive and overcome multiple cycles that have crashed many others. Hollywood leaves out several years and multiple relationship dysfunctions, as well as minimizing the fact that it was his drive to be successful that actually led him to make a series of decisions that resulted in his homelessness. But during this time, he also experienced many, many blessings, though not in the financial type. And so, these are the decisions he made. He made a commitment that his children would always know who their father was. His mother and father were absent when he was being raised. He was surrounded by alcoholism, domestic abuse, and illiteracy, and he was determined not to allow these things to consume him or identify him. He graduated from high school, he served in the Navy, and then he received a position as a researcher at the California School of Medicine he planned to become a doctor. Now this is a man who is blessed with talent, and it seems like he is on a good career path. But a lack of financial resources that are available for young African-American men resulted in him making a career choice that ended up in him being hom homeless. 
the necessary years of ed education, the overwhelming expenses of medical school, and the birth of his first child led him to abandon his dreams to become a doctor in search of a more lucrative career in the financial world. This is where he yielded to temptation. This is the portion of his life that's included in the movie. Now, Gardner's pathway to success did not pay his bills, and the requirements of his job actually resulted in him getting $1,200 worth of parking tickets that he couldn't afford to pay. He had an argument with his girlfriend. Police were called. He was arrested. A black man, which then discovered, they, they discovered his unpaid parking tickets. And even though his girlfriend dropped the charges, he spent 10 days in jail while his girlfriend cleaned out the apartment and left town with his son. And so he gets out of jail. He has no experience, no college education, virtually no connections. And he ends up going to an interview at Dean Witter Reynolds' stock brokerage training program. He gets, he gets the position. He's a successful person, but the position offers no salary. And apart from selling medical equipment, which brought in about $300 a month, he was unable to meet his living expenses, and, and he ended up homeless. And then a couple months later, his girlfriend says, you can have your son. So he now is homeless with custody of his son. So being homeless is not a blessing. In fact, Gardner's story, despite turning out well for him, is a travesty of social justice issues. In the hierarchy of how people are treated by our justice system, the African-American male is treated the worst. He had a job. It was a low-paying job. It didn't pay enough to cover his rent and living expenses, let alone leave him free to train and learn and, and to become successful. There were places where he could afford to stay, but they didn't allow children. There were shelters for single mothers, but not single fathers. Uh, he occasionally ended up sleeping in bathrooms at the BART station with his son, knowing that if the wrong people became aware of his homelessness, homelessness, he would lose custody of his son to the foster care system. So I'm sure that Gardner would not look back at this segment of his life, which became the movie, and say, that year was the most blessed time in my life. But there were blessings. There were blessings. He remained true to his commitment to be in his son's life. He remained true to his commitment to avoid alcohol and drugs. He remembered his mother's wisdom. You can depend only on yourself. The cavalry ain't coming. His son, who was between the age of two and three at the time that this happened, doesn't remember being homeless. He only remembers moving around a lot and that his father was always around. His father was always around no matter what. Now, these are blessings. The decisions that, that Gardner made that were oriented toward good. They result, I mean, what, what Jeremiah says is, do things that keep yourself oriented toward God. So he's oriented toward the right things, good things, God things. And then the fruits of that orientation are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Gardner turned out okay. That's a picture of him. In fact, he is now considerably wealth, wealthy. But Jesus also warns us against becoming too content. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who are laughing. And I think it's important for us to receive these warnings with grace and, and realize that wealth and privilege are gifts not to be hoarded and relied upon, but to be shared in a way that helps others to reach their highest potential. Gardner gives back. He gives to the Glide Memorial Church, which at the time was a United Methodist Church that provided him with shelter when he needed it mo the most. It's because of him, it changed from being a women's shelter to a family shelter to allow single, single fathers to get help as well. He has, raised, he has helped to fund a $50 million project in San Francisco that creates low-income housing and opportunities for employment in the area of the city where he was once homeless. 
and as well as offering mon monetary support, Gardner donates clothing and shoes and also makes himself available for permanent job placement assistance, career counseling, and comprehensive job training for the homeless population and at-risk communities in, in Chicago. Now, Gardner could have achieved success and put his homelessness behind him, but instead, he chose to return to where he came from and give back to the communities that blessed him during his journey. So I think that that is our call and our warning in these passages today. Many of us would not consider ourselves wealthy, but we have wealth, and we have privilege, and we have status. We don't necessarily worry about whether we're going to have shelter over our heads tonight. Not every day. But Jesus calls us to remember and respond to those in the world who do not share these benefits. This call is more than simply offering a few dollars here and there. It's about working to change the system so that homeless people do have hope and that those who live in poverty are not constantly in fear of becoming homeless. It's about changing our thinking so that the color of a person's skin or their gender or their ethnicity doesn't determine whether they are incarcerated or whether they are just fined and sent home. It's about giving up some of our privilege so that those without privilege have opportunities to be successful. Jeremiah reminds us that our heart, mind, will, ego, and self can be easily deceived if we don't keep ourselves oriented towards God. Jesus challenges us with blessings and woes to remind us that contentment, such as wealth and privilege, can deceive us into ignoring much of what is wrong in the world. Jesus redefines our circumstances, and he promises a different kind of happiness, justice for all, which is good news for the poor and the underprivileged. And so the question I have for you today is, is this something that you are willing to work toward? Would you be willing to share a portion of your wealth and privilege to change your life and the lives of others in order to fully experience the kingdom of God? It's a difficult question, but one worth considering. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. Amen.